When the preliminary report on UPS 2976 came out, most people focused on the shocking CCTV frames the engine lifting away from the wing during rotation. But the deeper truth behind this accident doesn't start with the moment the pylon failed. It starts decades earlier in the way the MD-11's engine mounting system was designed, certified, tested, and carried forward into aging freighter service. What looks like one violent instantaneous failure is actually the final chapter of a problem that was building slowly, invisibly, and quietly long before that morning in Louisville. Today I want to go deeper, not just into what separated or when, but why this type of failure is uniquely dangerous, why it escaped detection, and why it has implications for every high-time trijet still flying today. Because the real reason UPS 2976 was lost isn't just the fracture you can see on the wreckage. It's also the assumptions that the industry made about hardware that was supposed to last a lifetime. To understand why this accident unfolded the way it did, we need to start with the MD-11's pylon design itself. The number one and number three engines sit under the wings using a dual lug mounting system, one forward lug and one aft lug connected to spherical bearings. On paper, it's a straightforward design. It's been used on countless aircraft. But the MD-11 system has one trait that matters more than anything else. The two lugs don't carry equal loads at all phases of flight. During rotation, the aft mount takes the hardest hit. As the aircraft pitches up thrust and aerodynamic forces load that single connection point with a spike in stress far beyond anything experienced during cruise or taxi. Engineers know this. It's built into the certification margins. But what they couldn't fully test back in the late 1980s was how that stress would behave through decades of real-world cargo operation, maximum thrust departures, heavy cycles, short-haul patterns, and high-frequency usage that trijets often endure long after passenger fleets have retired. The crucial vulnerability is that the aft lug sits deep inside the pylon structure packed between layers of metal sealant and lubrication. It's a protected component good for performance, but bad for detection. If the bearing wears unevenly over time, the lug starts absorbing loads it wasn't meant to take. And the earliest cracks, those microscopic beginnings of fatigue, are almost impossible to see without fully dismantling the assembly. So when people ask, why didn't maintenance catch this? The uncomfortable answer is the design simply doesn't make early cracking easy to detect. That's not a criticism of any mechanic or inspector. It's a structural reality one that becomes more significant as these aircraft age into their third decade of service. When viewers first see the CCTV frames, the engine's upward trajectory looks almost surreal. Engines are heavy. They're supposed to hang downward. So why did this one shoot upward instead? The answer lies in a combination of mechanical forces that only come together in a very narrow slice of the takeoff profile. And this is where UPS 2976 stands apart from earlier events like AA191 on the DC-10 or other pylon-related incidents. During rotation, the MD-11's engine is not just hanging under the wing, it becomes a spinning gyroscope with tremendous rotational energy. When the aircraft nose pitches up, that spinning mass reacts with a torque that tries to twist the engine sideways and upward. Under normal circumstances, the aft mount absorbs this moment without complaint. But if the aft lug is already weakened even slightly, the physics become unforgiving. This is why the engine didn't fall backward or drop under the wing. It reacted exactly the way a high RPM turbine is expected to react the instant its structural restraint gives way. It pivoted upward, cleared the wing, and arced over the fuselage. And this upward departure is more dangerous than a downward one because it disrupts the wing's airflow in a way that instantly destroys lift. A dropped engine might still allow some controllability. An upward moving one takes the smooth airflow with it. The MD-11's wing is extremely sensitive to disruption at high angle of attack. And the moment the airflow was disturbed, the pilots were fighting a battle they realistically couldn't win. What makes this even more sobering is that UPS 2976 experienced the single worst possible combination of separation direction timing and rotational forces. If the lug had failed two seconds earlier or three seconds later, the physics would have been different. Maybe survivable, maybe not, but definitely different. This is the hidden tragedy behind this event. It wasn't just that the lug failed. It failed at the exact moment of maximum stress in the exact direction that produced the most catastrophic aerodynamic consequences. Every major structural component on an airliner is tested during certification. Loads are modeled. 
Fatigue life is calculated. Engineers run simulations until every number fits the margins. But there's a truth the industry doesn't like to talk about. Certification testing is based on assumptions. The assumption that a lug will behave the same in year 30 as it did in year 1. The assumption that bearing wear will stay within predictable limits. The assumption that lubrication and loading conditions will remain consistent over thousands of cycles. The MD-11 was certified with wide safety margins. But it wasn't certified for the environment it would eventually live in decades of cargo operations long after its passenger service years ended. The stresses that come from heavy max thrust departures day after day are different from what the plane saw when it was new. This is where the concept of a testing gap becomes important. Engineers can simulate fatigue, but they can't simulate the uneven realities of old hardware, slight corrosion microscopic bearing play, years of sealant hardening or subtle shifts in load paths that emerge only after tens of thousands of cycles. The preliminary report's metallurgical findings hint at exactly this kind of long-term evolution. Cracks on both sides of the aft lug. Fatigue on the forward lug. A fractured bearing race. These are the signatures of a component that was working harder than the design originally predicted. And this raises an uncomfortable question. Were the original inspection intervals created decades ago ever meant to protect aircraft operating this long and this heavily? That doesn't mean the intervals were wrong. It means the environment changed and the assumptions didn't change with it. Certification is a snapshot in time, but fatigue is a moving target. This is why the UPS 2976 failure is so important. It isn't just a mechanical event. It's a moment where the realities of aging aircraft collided with the limits of decades-old design assumptions. When the NTSB says fatigue cracking, that can sound like a generic phrase. But in structural forensics, the location and direction of those cracks tell you the entire story of how a component was living, breathing, and suffering inside the airplane years before the accident. The aft lug on UPS 2976 didn't simply fracture once. It cracked progressively on both sides of the lug, showing a pattern that points to asymmetric loading. That means for some period of time, the lug was not sharing forces evenly with the forward mount. Something in its load path was shifting millimeter by millimeter, cycle by cycle. Now, does that automatically mean a maintenance error, improper lubrication, or some missed step? No. In fact, the preliminary report makes it clear the aircraft was in compliance. That's why the crack pattern is so unsettling. It's the structural equivalent of discovering that someone has been walking with a limp for years, but the limp was hidden inside the bone. The forward lug also showed fatigue on the inboard side with overstress failure on the outboard side. In simple terms, the forward lug was trying to catch the engine the moment the aft lug finally let go. But it wasn't designed to carry that load alone. So when the aft lug ruptured, the forward lug suffered a split-second overload and its weakest corner tore open. Then there's the spherical bearing. It's supposed to provide controlled movement like a universal joint. But its outer race had a circumferential fracture, a sign that internal wear may have created unbalanced loading. This is the part that chills engineers because bearings are meant to be the shock absorbers of the mount system. If your absorber starts transferring unbalanced force into a lug over years, fatigue accelerates. The pieces fit together too perfectly to ignore a bearing starting to wear, a lug taking more load than expected, fatigue patterns growing silently, then the exact wrong moment rotation. The crack patterns aren't just damage markers, they're a fingerprint of a mount system that slowly drifted out of its ideal load-sharing behavior. Not catastrophically, not suddenly, but just enough that one moment one high-stress pitch-up became its breaking point. If there's one moment in this entire event that carries almost symbolic weight, it's the act of rotation. The aircraft had already accelerated the pilots called rotate, the nose pitched up and the aerodynamic environment around the pylon shifted instantly. Rotation is more than a gesture. It is the single most violent transition an engine mount ever sees. The wing is changing angle, the engine is resisting the gyroscopic mass, is trying to twist sideways, and the aircraft structure is bending under aerodynamic load. This is exactly the moment when the aft mount has to carry its greatest burden. So what happens if a lug has microscopic fatigue cracks at that moment? They don't just grow, they race forward through the metal. And when a lug fails under tensile load at rotation, the release of energy is immediate and violent. It's like snapping a rope that's been stretched almost to its breaking point. The tension doesn't ease, it explodes. This is why the engine didn't sag or tilt. It popped upward with incredible force, guided by the stored torque of the spinning rotor and the upward pitch of the airplane. 
that force redirected the engine's path over the wing and into the airflow that normally generates lift. And here's the part that many people underestimate. The MD-11's aerodynamic margins during takeoff are razor thin. The airplane is heavy, its wing loading is high, and the MD-11 is known for being unforgiving at low speed with asymmetric thrust. Losing one engine at rotation is a challenge. Losing two because the tail engine ingested debris and began stalling is unrecoverable. At 30 feet, there is no time for acceleration, no altitude to trade, no runway left to lower the nose. The aircraft is in a transition state, neither fully flying nor fully on the ground, and that is the worst possible moment to introduce asymmetric thrust, asymmetric lift, and unstable tail airflow all at once. But that's exactly what the engine's upward separation caused. The wing's lift collapsed on the left side, the tail engine began surging, the aircraft yawed hard as the right engine continued producing maximum thrust. And despite all that, the CCTV frames show the pilots getting the airplane almost back to wings level. People sometimes underestimate what that means. For a crew to counter that much chaos in seconds speaks to incredible professionalism. But physics does not negotiate. The airplane simply ran out of energy and lift before it could climb out. When the aft lug failed at rotation, the outcome became tragically locked in. With only a preliminary report available, we're still early in the investigation. But even now, one message is surfacing clearly. Some structural components don't age visibly. They age internally, quietly, and out of view. And when they finally fail, they fail decisively. This isn't a story about blame, missed maintenance, or shortcuts. The UPS MD-11 was compliant. Its intervals were met. Its lubrication was recent. The crack was simply hiding in a place where no conventional inspection could see it until it was too late. What this accident highlights is a shift in the aviation landscape. Many older trijets still in service today weren't originally designed to fly heavy cargo cycles for 30 years. Their certification tests didn't anticipate the real-world environments they would eventually face, and fatigue, especially around bearings and mounts, doesn't politely wait for inspection intervals. The tragedy of UPS 2976 forces a question the industry hasn't had to confront openly before. Should legacy fleets be inspected based on age usage and structural vulnerability, not just cycle count? Because what we learned here is that a mount system can follow every rule pass, every interval, meet every requirement, and still fail under the right combination of stress wear and time. This doesn't undermine the MD-11's legacy. It doesn't suggest that cargo aviation is unsafe. What it does is remind us that airplanes evolve as they age. Load paths shift. Bearings loosen. Lugs begin to carry forces they didn't carry as new airframes. And when a design depends heavily on a single aft mount at the moment of rotation, that mount becomes more than just hardware. It becomes a gatekeeper between safety and catastrophe. UPS 2976 is going to reshape how operators think about these components. I think we're going to see more frequent inspections, more teardown evaluations, and possibly new non-destructive testing methods for these older pylons. The data is simply too compelling to ignore. In the end, the real reason this accident happened isn't just the crack that finally let go, it's the long, hidden journey of that crack through decades of stress. And it's a reminder that in aging aircraft, the most dangerous failures are the ones that grow in silence.